Hey everybody, it's Taylor Sparks again, and thanks again for joining me on another video on my materials informatics series. Real quick, thanks for being here. There's a lot of great machine learning resources out there. There's a lot of other uh, content creators out there. I appreciate that you're supporting me. Honestly, the reason I make these videos is because people say that it helps them in the comments and they shoot me, you know, thank you emails and it means a lot to me. So I'm glad to do this and I'm excited to teach this lesson today. Now, that said, if there's a ton of different machine learning resources out there, and there are, and some good ones, why bother learning something specific to materials informatics? Is there a difference? Is it the same thing? Can we get away with it? Or should we learn some specific tools for materials informatics, right? That's the point of this video today. So I think that there are some unique things that we ought to consider. Consider the following. When you compare traditional versus materials informatics, right? Traditional machine learning versus materials informatics, let's consider the following. Data availability, the task that you're trying to do, data heterogeneity, uncertainty quantification, features, and interpretability. If they're all the exact same, then why bother? Just go to your, your nearest Coursera course on machine learning and do that. But I think there's some differences here, so let's dive into them. First, let's start with the data that's available, right? When we look at data for traditional machine learning, it will blow your mind. Go to Kaggle, right? And under data sets, you'll see lots of different ones with all sorts of really cool topics and tons of data. Or how about this one? There's a really great article I saw the other day on towardsai.net, uh, just published recently, actually. Um, and if you look at it, first off, they start by saying, you know, what are these databases out there for machine learning? They have they show these database finders, right? So things like Kaggle or the Google Dataset Search or the Big Bad NLP database, right? Um, and then they actually dive into the actual data sets and they talk about them. So take a look at this one. Google Landmarks, right? Version 2 has 5 million images plus of over 200,000 plus landmarks. So we're talking big data. Um, similar, like the MNIST data set, that's a classic one for analog for computer vision, for interpreting handwriting, right? Write a number and a computer has to guess what number it was, a 7 or a wonky 4, right? 60,000 images, 10,000 testing images. So big data on these things. As you go down, you'll notice that, yeah, traditional machine learning tends to have some pretty massive data, and that's awesome. That's not the case in material science. Unfortunately, in material science, we tend to have really small data sets, right? If it's experimental data sets, you might have dozens of data points, or if you're lucky, maybe a few hundred. Uh, most data sets that I see in material science are typically less than, a, say, a thousand. Now, there are some exceptions, and we'll see these in my next video looking at data for material science. There are some repositories with 50,000, 100,000 maybe, um, but it's not the norm. It's the exception of the rule. Most of the time, we're dealing with small data sets, which means different algorithm choices. Okay? How about this next one? Is the task the same for machine learning as it is for uh, say something like materials informatics, right? Well, let's take the following. When you use Netflix, right, and you go to the suggested for you category, you'll notice that all of a sudden, Netflix knows all the shows you like to watch, right? They've got it all right there. They take a look at the shows that you like and they say, oh, this guy looks like he likes sci-fi, looks like he likes mystery, he likes comedy. I'm going to pick shows that are very similar to the ones that he's seen before because they do that based off of viewers that look a lot like me, similar country, similar age, similar demographic, blah, 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 using machine learning, then then say the average response, on average, he's probably gonna wanna watch these shows because they look a lot like the ones he's seen before. But that's not necessarily what we wanna do in materials informatics. In materials informatics, we often want to find the exceptions to the rule, right? We don't want to find some average new metal that has some average thermal conductivity. We might want to find the highest thermal conductor or the lowest thermal conductor, the one that expands the most or the least, right? We're looking at the extremes when it comes to prediction. So we want to learn from the average materials, all these normal materials, and find the extraordinary ones. So I've, I've done some work on that. I'll show you in a future video. But that's, I think, a pretty key difference between us and traditional machine learning. What else? Well, how about data heterogeneity? In traditional machine learning, the data, it's possible oftentimes to have it be quite homogeneous. But in material science, you're talking quite heterogeneous data, often measured by different modalities, meaning different ways of measuring it. Here's an example. When I say the word structure to a material scientist, what comes to mind? Well, it could be lots of things. It could be atomic structure, silicon bonded to oxygen, this oxygen bonded to aluminum, maybe a missing atom is what you're thinking of, the defects is maybe what you're thinking of, or maybe it's not that at all. Maybe you're saying it's not the immediate neighbors, it's the nearest neighbors around it, right? Maybe it's these six-membered rings that it forms, that sort of near 
range order is what matters. Or maybe another material scientist says, no, 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 I don't care about that. I care about the longer range order, right? The fact that these things have a layered structure and the layer is the key thing that, that that person cares about. Somebody else might say, no, 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 it's where, it's where these, dis, you know, these regions of different orientation come together and these grain boundaries, those interfaces are really what's important or secondary phases, pockets in between them. So somebody else might say, no, 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 it's the macroscopic properties with cracks and pores and you know, gradients in the properties throughout the bulk material. They're, none of them are incorrect. All those things are structure, right? And so from that one thing, we have a lot going on there. And then we measure them in this just circus of different ways. There's a gazillion different ways we measure these things, right? When I say structure, are you measuring that via diffraction? Like X-ray diffraction? Is it electron diffraction? Is it neutron diffraction? Synchrotron diffraction? Right? What is it? Is it is it pair distribution function? Right? Or is it microscopy? And if so, is it transmission electron microscopy? Is it scanning electron microscopy? Is it optical? Is it atomic force microscopy? Is it impedance spectroscopy? Right? What is it? Uh, and then when it comes to properties, right? Are we you know is it NMR? Is it UV vis? Is it FTIR? Is it man alphabet soup? There's a gazillion and one different techniques that we have to characterize this one thing that we call structure. So often what materials informatics people have to do is extract out information from that primary data, things like maybe the bond size or the lattice parameter or the defect concentration or whatever it may be uh, in order to actually make meaningful comparisons among your data, right? Um, another thing, take example properties, right? Even something as simple as say hardness, which we've been measuring for millennia is complicated. If you look at the old timers, the crystallographers, the gemologists, they've probably got their Mohs hardness kit where you literally have 10 different gems of different hardness and you scrape different rocks with different hardness of rocks and you know if it scrapes it, it must be harder than the thing you scraped and on and on. And then you've got on the other end, the polymers people doing their shore hardness test, which has basically take a bike inner tube and sort of press your finger into it. And you've got a shore hardness tester, <laughs> you know, a cheesy one. And then you've got things that look kind of like that, the Rockwell and Brunel and then Vickers and the Noop hardness measurements, these are all pretty similar in that they work kind of like the shore hardness that you're indenting your material something, but the type of thing that you're indenting with varies wildly. It might be a round ball bearing tip, it might be a little pyramid shape made out of diamond and everywhere in between. It might be a sort of elongated diamond or it might be a perfect, you know, normal one. So pretty wild differences in the way that we measure materials and to get, make it even better, there's no good conversion across these scales, right? If you look at these scales, here's like the Brunel, here's your Rockwell B, Rockwell C, the shore A, shore D, they're just all over the place. So very, very, you know, fragmented different modalities when we're talking about the data that's available for material science, unfortunately. All right, let's switch gears, talk about uncertainty quantification. This is important in material science because every time that we acquire new data or get new experiments from our predictions, it's expensive. And when I say expensive, I'm not just saying money, although money is there. You have to have your lab, your physical facilities in space, you have to have your materials to make it. But you also have to have a grad student or yourself to actually go and make these things in the lab. And that's time. And it probably won't work the first bunch of times. You have to purify it and figure out why it was failing. This all just takes time. It could be months before you get a material that you can measure. And then you have to measure it, right? So you got to characterize it, which means you have to buy the tool or borrow the tool or get expertise, you know, to do the tool. And it takes time on that tool. And then to analyze the data, months and months can go by. So think about that. In my research group, I have both experimentalist grad students and machine learning grad students. And sometimes my exper uh, machine learning grad students will say, hey, dude, check out this new compound. I predicted that it's going to be rad. And this guy's like, I don't know. <laughs> are you sure? How confident are you? Before I spend six months of my life chasing this thing, how sure are you that it's going to be rad? So that's important to figure out. Um, Uncertainty quantification is a big deal in material science. And then consider also the fact that the space that we're exploring is ginormous. We're looking at, I mean, go into Google right now and, and type four choose 83, meaning you've got four slots and you've got 83 options to choose from. How many po possibilities are there? How many combinations? You'll see that it's a massive number. And that's assuming a one to one to one ratio. When you then say, okay, I don't want just stoichiometric ratios because maybe D is a dopant. You're only gonna add three or five or 10%. When you go down to 3% increments on these things, it explodes to something like 10 to the 12th number of compounds that we're looking at. So this chemical design space or chemical white space is huge. We can't just test everything. We're gonna have to pick and choose, meaning we need to have confidence on what we predict if we're gonna be picking and choosing from that list, okay? All right, what about features? Features are really important. Features are a way of adding domain knowledge to your machine learning. Domain knowledge is basically you're telling it 
sort of a little bit about the problem ahead of time. Now that sort of flies in the face. Machine learning, its definition is like you make a computer do a task without telling it to how to do the task, right? And yet feature engineering is you sort of tell it how to do the task. You give it hints and tips. You provide it relevant information that might help it do a better job. So for example, um, let's go way back. When I was in the first year of college, my very first digital camera that I had, um, you know, it had facial recognition technology, this old Casio or whatever it was. I remember when you saw a picture of your face, it drew like a little green box around it. And I was like, blown away by this. It's so cool. So this comes from what are called Har-like features. Har comes from a guy, Har, H-A-A-R, right? Who came up with the Har wavelet, which is this little rectangle of white and gray that you can see here, right? Now, somebody, Paul Viola and his partner, I forgot his name, were the first to innovate, innovate this. And they basically said, hey, the human face has two eyes, a nose in the middle, you know, it has two nostrils, it has your lips, usually a white spot above your lip. And so take this face of Barack Obama and you can say, first off, make it black and white, kind of blur it a little bit. And you can see that, yeah, these har features, they sort of belong in a certain order for it to be a face. And so they brought all that human domain knowledge of what a face should look like. And they came up with a way of calculating a, a facial recognition algorithm. Now it wasn't great, it was pretty slow, which is why these have been replaced with modern techniques. And modern techniques rely on convolutional neural networks, which we will get to in a future video. But convolutional neural networks, right? You show it a face and you don't have to tell it that a human face has two eyes and two nostrils and a nose and all that jazz. It can learn it on its own. It starts with these low level features, right? Filters, which don't look like faces. And then you end up with these sort of mid-level features, which start to look like parts of a face, like an eye or a nose or a lip or something. And eventually you get to these high-level features, which look like faces, right? And so using this approach, it can learn what the features are on its own. You didn't have to tell it. You just gave it lots of data. So the question is, can we get away with that feature-free engineering in machine learning, in materials informatics, or do we need to tell it what the features are? So we did a study on this. Actually, last year we just released this paper. And what we found was... In the limit of having lots of data, we published this, by the way, in a great journal, Integrating Materials and Manufacturing Innovation, where I'm on the editorial board. Great journal. Check it out. Um, the article is titled, Is Domain Knowledge Necessary for Machine Learning Materials Properties? Right? Do you have to know some chemistry, or can you just let it learn on its own? And what we found is that in the limit of lots and lots of data, all of the approaches are basically as good as one another. Now, what we compared it to is average improvement over one hot. So one hot is a way to randomly encode the chemical formula. So the chemical formula, you take each element that might be in the formula, you just assign it yes or no, that element's present. You don't tell anything about the element. So this is, we'll talk about this in a future video when we get to features and you know the composition-based feature vector. But think of this as just the simplest way to encode a formula without telling it anything about chemistry. Now compare that with some of the other approaches like Jarvis and Matt Tavek and Magpie and Adam Tavek and all these other ones, or my favorite, Olienic, because my friend Anton Olienic came up with it. Great guy at Manhattan College in, in New York City, by the way. Um, now these have lots of chemical domain knowledge. They basically tell the computer that potassium and sodium have some similarities, right? And you know, the, these both have the same number of electrons or different group or whatever it is. We, we encode chemical information in that approach. And there we see that turns out that in the limit of low data, say a hundred data points up to a thousand, adding this domain knowledge is really helpful. And it's only when you get to higher amounts where, yeah, it doesn't really help as much. You can just, you don't need features to learn it. Since material science is a data starved field where we typically have small data sets, very, very often are we gonna be less than 10,000 data points, basically all the time. Features are gonna to continue to be important for materials informatics. Then the last topic is explainability, right? Interpretability. Now, I started out this video saying that, hey, materials informatics is this really important field because we take all these things like uh, structure, property, processing, performance, and we find the linkages between them. These structure, property, process linkages are the heart of material science. And if we don't understand those, that's pretty disappointing. What some machine learning algorithms could do is say, in comes a structure, out comes a property, but we never know the reason why. We never learn the mechanism, the, the physical or chemical insight that would be a real loss to the field. And so when it comes to choosing the algorithms, you know, you've got deep learning approaches like neural networks and SVMs, which are pretty rad too. Um, and those can be really accurate at the expense of explainability and interpretability. And then you've got linear models, which might be not as high performing, but much more interpretable. Maybe that's more important to consider. So I think thinking about interpretability is also important. For all these reasons, let's summarize them. 
I think that it's worth your time to take a course like the one I'm teaching today on materials informatics, where we're going to talk about the specifics of machine learning in the materials research context because we don't have lots of data, because we care about finding extremes over averages, because we have multimodal, messy, gross data compared to others. We care about uncertainty. We care about interpretability. We're probably going to have to featureize our data because we don't have a lot of data to start with. Um, for all these reasons, I think it's important that we are taking a course like this. So I'm sure glad that you're here. Uh, this dovetails nicely into our next video, which is going to be on materials data repositories. We're going to do a two part. First, we're going to materials data repositories, show you what's out there. Then we're going to show you some examples of how you can access some of that data. So thanks for being here. Do me a favor if you haven't yet. Hit subscribe, hit like, drop me a comment. Tell me what you liked or what you didn't like about this video. I would love to hear it because honestly, you're the people uh, out there. You're the reasons that I'm making these videos. I hope it's useful for you. Um, I'm going to have, I plan to have 30 or 40 videos in this series. But if you've got something you want to make sure makes the cut, drop it in the comment. I'll make sure to get to it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you next in the video.